Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to the Murmurations podcast. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, Professor Paul Bowman. Uh, Paul is Professor of Cultural Studies at Cardiff University. He's published lots and lots of stuff, uh, most recently Deconstructing Martial Arts and has recently started the Martial Arts Studies podcast and a couple of years ago launched the Martial Arts Studies Journal. So I wanted to talk to Paul today about more broadly cultural studies to begin with and with the question of is cultural studies trivial and then moving more specifically into uh, martial arts studies and some of the research that he's done in recent years. So morning Paul. Good morning Darren, how are you? I'm very good, thank you very much. Um, I think now is quite a good time to be chatting again. I know we chatted quite recently yeah. um, and we chatted a lot about martial arts before. Today I just wanted to, to chat more broadly about cultural studies really. I think now is quite an interesting time to be having a conversation because it feels like critical scholars will be arguing that cultural studies is as important now as it's ever been with what's going on. So um, I just wanted to pitch the question to you really to especially to those who are less familiar with cultural studies mm. is cultural studies trivial um no let's there's two ways of going at it we're recording this on um the i think the 12th of june or, or, um 2020 we've been in lockdown for three months and the uh, world has um taken notice of the racial tensions in the United States of America. Again, we've the, the Black Lives Matter protests have kicked off. We've had protests in Britain about Black Lives Matter. We've had famous instances of the, 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 the recent movement has been to try and kind of decolonize British history. So the, the, the throwing in Bristol of the statue of um, uh, Lord Colston, who was a, a slave trader who became a millionaire in Bristol. Uh, in the water has provoked all kinds of discussions about the about decolonizing British history, about British history's colonial past and the violence upon which um, so many cultures and empires and nations were built. And I think that cultural studies, if you look, has been one of the, the, the few academic areas that have engaged with these issues from the start. Cultural studies was born as a concern with um, several different things. Um, first, things that you could call decolonizing, right? Decolonize. So, so cultural studies was born from a, a dissatisfaction with sociology, dissatisfaction with English literature and English studies, dissatisfaction with anthropology, because of these disciplines were so streamlined and kind of, let's just say, so aristocratic and so elitist, so that on the English literature syllabus, you are reading uh, a big long list of dead white guys. The canon of, of, of English literature was a, was a canon of dead white guys and questions were asked about, you know, what about the women? What about poor people? What, what about non-whites? What about colonial subjects? What about, what, what about all of this? And also in terms of, in disciplines like, you know, emergent disciplines like sociology, the concerns were very kind of high social. Cultural studies uh, in the Birmingham University tradition of people like Stuart Hall was basically a broadening of those questions and those concerns. Um, to, to ask, well, what, where, where are the women? Uh, where are the non-white voices? And I think that what we're seeing now um, is, a kind of, is a kind of expression of, of the same problematics that cultural studies has been thinking about for many decades now. Not just cultural studies, I'm not claiming cultural studies is the birthplace of, of political consciousness, but cultural studies isn't trivial because if you look at the concerns of cultural studies since the 1960s, it's the things that are coming back front and center now racism, anti-racism, sexism, anti-sexism, the history of colonialism, questions of heritage. What do we do with these statues? Like, oh, should we, should we tear up a past and throw it in the bin? Or is that just a terrible kind of revisionism that is, is as ugly as the, as, as, as the violent history before? So no, it's called trivial. People think cultural studies are trivial because it's long looked at things like media studies, soap operas, pop music, popular fiction, things that people think are trivial. But they're not trivial because we live them. We love them. We, we, we come in from work and now we put the television, well, we used to put the TV on, now it's the computer yeah. or whatever we put on. So short answer, no. Excellent. Um, the, on the, the, the Bristol, the statue in Bristol, what concerns me about the way in which that story is being talked about is just the very simple story of uh, a mob on a protest, rip a statue up, throw it in the water. 
and actually there's been a long campaign to actually think about what could be done with this statue this it wasn't just the mob going to rip it up and throwing it away yeah. there's been a long campaign where people have been suggesting this be relocated to a museum or um uh a, a, a plaque put next to it to recontextualize it yeah. all of these kinds of things that could have revised its its kind of cultural purpose or what it means to people um or drawing atten more attention to the past that it represents which would have been a much more uh perhaps progressive way forward but it does concern me that that's all being left out and it's just a mob ripping it up well, I think it, it depends where you look. I mean, I, I um, obviously we live in, in social media and we, we are in our own echo chambers. And, and if people disagree with us, we get annoyed and we silence them or we unfriend them or we you know unfollow them or whatever. But actually, I mean, I've been quite passively listening to BBC Radio 2, Radio 4, you know, when you're in the kitchen doing stuff, the radio's on. And I've, I've heard some quite balanced debate. I've, I've seen some quite balanced journalistic article, well, journal, journalist, journalism articles, journalism, um, especially in the, the newspapers that I would most be inclined to read, such as the, the kind of broadly intellectual left-leaning press like The Guardian. I haven't looked at a lot of the tabloid debates around that, but I know that I've seen a lot of the, a lot of the reactionary responses, such as, the, like, you know, memes, online saying no white person has ever owned a slave no black person living has ever been a slave so let's just move on and it's like they go hang on a minute it's more complicated than that mm -hmm. i have seen some quite complicated some quite subtle and complex discussions in the mainstream media but it, it's one of those things every it's a hall of mirrors isn't it it's where you look and it's how your yeah. chamber is laid out so I don't know. I think that what I've seen of, of, of the, the, the institutional voices and the institutional stakeholders involved, that it, there, is a, there is a serious debate going on about how do we engage with this, shall we call it a problematic cultural past? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think what the problem I was talking about was more the, the polarised social media splitting of the debate. That's really what I meant. Um, and again, it's, it's that problem of the the two extremities you're either this you're either one or the other and i think i think that's what's really important about cultural studies is that it's when it's at its best it's trying to cut through that and not be um just just pulled apart by the the, the kind of polarization that we keep seeing yeah i mean Stuart hall who was you know the the director of the center for um contemporary cultural studies in birmingham not the tv present not the shamed uh, TV presenter of the 70s but the yeah. the, uh, the the black um, academic who died recently um, it still feels recent to me um, he he once said cultural studies is not about looking at a text and saying that's racist throw it in the bin that's sexist throw it in the bin it's about looking at the way that a cultural context or a media context or an environment is racialized so you can look at the shift the cultural studies would do if you're Stuart Hall you do what he would call a conjunctural analysis where you look at all the factors that seem to be all the ingredients that are going into a situation that affect what we think at any given time and the fact who we think the bad guy is whether that be um, you know post post-war uh, Pakistani immigrants or whether it be immigrants from from the Caribbean or whether then subsequently it becomes immigrants from the former uh, from Eastern Europe from the former Soviet Union and so on because where society is racialized in different ways and the media feeds into this and generates moral panics and people get organized around different issues and so it's not about evaluating good or bad and right and wrong it's about being able to take a stand and go this is where people's passions are and this is these are the cause of the passions and these are the interests behind the passions uh, and and these are the stakes and these are this is the the kind of this this is how we might ethically navigate these waters or pragmatically navigate the waters so for instance um after the stephen lawrence murder and the stephen lawrence inquiry stuart hall was also on a on a, the inquiry uh panel and that was the panel that produced the concept of institutional racism and put it out there in the world and said the the london metropolitan police w was let's say was institutionally racist which is why there were systemic failures that led the police to be able, without thinking in that kind of unconscious bias sense, treat black people very, very differently to white people. 
and that that is what needs to be addressed on a structural institutional on a structural institutional level so a cultural studies is useful for that kind of critical thinking about what are the institutions what are the mechanisms what is the status quo what power does the media have what do the, what role are the politicians playing and it is precisely about trying not to polarize it's like you look at how a situation is polarized i think why and what could be used to kind of maybe alleviate a tense situation or or, or modify violence into into you know some kind of agonism rather than antagonism yeah yeah i mean when i look at my social media and i i look at the people who i drink with on a friday night or would drink with normally on a friday night uh and they're good people they are really good people but they see this a lot of them see this debate as uh we're, we're being accused of being racist or all lives don't matter and that that it it's that's the concern is how how i think the question is and i'm not expecting you to just answer it on the spot but how can we really move on to that divisive discourse by bringing these this this kind of context that you've just displayed so well more prominently into the into the kind of public debate but <laughs> that's a big deal. yeah i think that people people live in contradictory worlds at the same time don't they i mean on, on the one hand someone could could like something that a real left winger shares and a real kind of some a real you know like woke kind of person shares and then something that's really racist or really stupid or really ignorant and we could people can 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 be racist and can be and people will be racist and will be sexist and will be prejudiced in ways that they aren't aware of and would react quite violently to say, I am not a racist, I am not a sexist, I am not homophobic. Mm. Um, but I think that the responsibility of, of us to our friends, my, my first reaction is, is always one of you know, taking the moral high ground. And as a person, not as a scholar, but as, as me, um, but I want, them, I, want, I want them gone. I don't want to hear them. I don't want to speak to them. I want them gone. I'm angry at them. But a lot of the, the, the debates recently, the, the, the mainstream cultural debates about, you know, what, what is the relationship of white people to this, this Black Lives Matter movement? And um, we should be involved and we should be speaking to each other. And if, and, 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 you know, because just because like we might all be sitting in a room, we might all be white men. And if we get the homophobic or racist or sexist statement, it's our responsibility to say, oh, come on. You know, that's not, have a think about what you've just said and, and can you yeah. think about and maybe we don't want to have arguments in the pub on a Friday night we don't want to get angry and we've got to go oh, come on like really yeah. I think it's our responsibility not to and you know it's not just like not laughing at the joke it's actually going do you see why can you see why that's wrong mm -hmm. you know and it's a very simple thing it's like what did Antonio Gramsci called it being like permanent persuaders mm -hmm. you've always got to be on duty but you don't always have to be polemical yeah if, you, just... if you're talking to your friend or an uncle or an auntie or someone who you know you want to be gentle with i think you can still be gentle and go I, I see i don't find that funny because or i disagree with that because and it's it, it, it's tricky but that you've got to try and do that i think yeah it's really hard i mean i try sometimes and i'm, and I'm, I'm not saying i'm always i, I sometimes it, nobody can finish a sentence and you do end up wasting half your friday night on an argument there's other times where I do just choose just to to not engage or not laugh, and I don't sort of fulfil that duty that we just you just mentioned. And then there's other times where you do feel like you have a mini breakthrough, and you think, oh, actually, mm. oh, it's interesting when that person's not in the circle, that person's willing to drop their bravado for a minute, yeah, and they're willing to show a bit of compassion. Yeah, none of us are one person, are we? I mean, no. we have different personas, and we play different roles in different social transactions and social interactions, and yeah yeah and you don't want to be you know it's like sarah ahmed's twitter um account was like she was feminist killjoy wasn't she but you know she she was she was like do we have to be the killjoy just because especially when you move into the realms of oh i was just having a bit of a joke it's like yeah but you need to think about why that isn't funny or why i wouldn't find that funny or or why that might be offensive and would you say that joke to a room full of black people would you say a joke that joke to a room full of women and yeah, I mean, the, the same battles need to be fought all the time. And I'm not yeah. saying I am not sexist. I'm not saying that I'm not racist or that I'm not homophobic or transphobic. Or, because these are all issues that we have to face up to as, as people. And we have to think about power structures and what our values are and so on and so on. 
no one is perfect. We've all got to be aware that we've constantly got to interrogate ourselves. And I think that yeah. cultural studies, to bring it back to cultural studies, yeah. is the field where students are en encouraged to critically engage with their their biases, their prejudices, to look at the institutional supports or, or the traditions or the rituals that we live in and live through and the media environments that, that feed our imaginations. And cultural studies is, is immediate, like media studies and like much gender studies and, and so on and so on. Um, these are the academic environments that encourage um, uh, individual students to become critical, to, critical intellectuals really for the rest of their lives, hopefully, to the extent that that might stay with them. Yeah. I mean, you've mentioned two things there that, that overlap with some of my own interests. So one, one, one scholar that I'm particularly interested in is Carl Jung and the idea of the shadow. And the reason a lot of the things you're just saying in relation to cultural studies work quite well alongside the idea of the shadow is because we all have those subconscious or unconscious sides to ourselves that we like to just sort of push to one side and we say, well, that's not me. I, I you know, I, then we project all those negative parts that from our unconscious onto other people because it's out there that the problem is we're all you know it's very easy for us to think we're we're perfect and all the problems are out there so confronting your shadow is a really important part of doing this kind of work you're talking about because you can only start to really empathize and engage if you realize that the faults that we see in other people are faults that we carry in ourselves as well and it's just our critical awareness of those faults that is important rather than pretending that we're perfect. Um, the other thing you mentioned was persona. Uh, so persona studies is a growing field and um, a lot of the research that you've done already on Bruce Lee, even if you weren't explicitly talking about or engaging with the persona studies in its current form at the time, really connects well with that. So in terms of persona, do you want to talk about a little bit about your research on Bruce Lee and why Bruce Lee was a really uh, kind of important person in popular culture? Well, I'm, I've given this origin story lots of times. Well, it was never really about Bruce Lee for me. Bruce Lee was a, a doorway into, into something that I wanted to work out how to study. Sure. Because I, I was, I, I grew up in cultural studies then uh, and, and cultural theory. Um, so my PhD was all really about, like, it was real hardcore kind of post-structuralist political and cultural theory. Um, but in that, in, in reading kind of post-colonial theory and post-modern theory and so on, I, I used to always think that Bruce Lee was a, was a very important figure at a very important time historically. Um, and so on the one hand, whenever I would mention Bruce Lee to other academics, they would like laugh because they thought he was trivial, right? They thought yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. was top socky and, 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 and I would say, no, you don't like, you don't know, you don't know the effect that Bruce Lee had on the world. And you don't know, A, how intelligent and clever and innovative he was and how amazing he was. And he wasn't just a film star. He wasn't just like, we need an actor. Here's an actor, do some kicks. It was not <laughs> that, it was really, really revolutionary. So, so I wanted to write about Bruce Lee on the one hand to show the people who, who didn't um, get it, that, that Bruce Lee ticked all the boxes uh, as a, an incredibly important um, cultural force, popular cultural force. Um, like, you know, I would line him up with Elvis Presley, maybe Che Guevara as an idea, these kinds of figures, and Muhammad Ali, these kinds of figures who are like enormously, Jimi Hendrix, these kinds of figure, right? Who were just like, wow, they totally changed the landscape. Um, but on the other hand, I also wanted to find a way to write about martial arts, something that I'd, and physical culture generally, like, you know, weightlifting and, and, and martial arts and bodybuilding, and, which Bruce Lee was equally obsessed with. But I didn't know how to do that because I'm not a historian. I'm, I didn't have, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not an ethnographer. I, I couldn't write a, a neutral history. Like, here's the new history of martial arts in, I couldn't, I just wasn't equipped to do that. But what I was equipped to do was to carry out film and media analysis and put it into a cultural context and go, look at the way that, that Bruce Lee changed film. Look at the way that Bruce Lee put the very concept of martial arts on the map. Everybody wanted to do Kung Fu after Bruce Lee. He, he kicked off what is called the Kung Fu craze of the early 1970s. So for me, it was, it was two things. It was, let's take this guy, seriously. let's take this, not this guy, but this event, this, this, in, this intervention, I guess, not the persona, but yes, the persona, 
because he was a a character who people wanted to follow, wanted to try and be like, yeah. admired, revered. Um, but you could also take him in different dimensions. Like for me, it was less about, I didn't want to be, I didn't really care about him as a person. I was, in, what it was, was what he seemed to offer in terms of uh, fighting, genius yeah, yeah. And, and skill and, and tips and tricks and train like this and think like this and interact with your opponent like this. So there was all, it was all of that. And then that got me into being able to write about martial arts in the media, martial art, the relationship between the media representation and our everyday lives and practices, because anyone I think who's walked into a, a martial arts club has in some sense been influenced by what they've seen on a screen, whether that yes. be a game or a film or a, yeah. or, or a character or, and you go, I want to be like that. I want to be able to do that. Mm. And so I, I was interested in that relationship between the fake, the fictional, the, simu the simulation and the lived embodied, uh, passionate, trained ritualized life you know yeah yeah i think that's why it really interested me because it wasn't just about him as a person but all of those other meanings and and for different contexts in which he performed and appeared and so on and what it made culturally um on that point then where bruce lee or the work you did on bruce lee took you or gave you the opportunity to talk more about martial arts studies tell us a bit about the response in the field of cultural studies to you kind of really trying to run run ahead with um, martial arts studies as an established discipline in the field of cultural studies yeah well um, <laughs> put it this way right if you um, if you write an article that's got a word in the title like Zizek or Rancière or Badieu or Foucault or Derrida or Lacan or something like that and you put it on academia.edu and if you write another one, that's just something about Bruce Lee or martial arts. The one with the names of the theorists gets thousands of hits, thousands. The one with Bruce Lee or martial arts in the title gets dozens moving up to hundreds over time. So when I was writing, when I was working and publishing and writing about cultural theory and political theory, it was like, uh, it was kind of like I was becoming a name, like I was becoming a theorist that you might line up with, with other theorists. Like you might go like Ray Chow or Judith Butler. Or, and I, I could have, I could easily have just gone blah, 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 and just been slotted into and like sort of shoulder barged my way into that kind of space. But it was ultimately quite, I felt quite bored by that because like anyone can guff on about politics and how the world should be better and how we should be nicer to each other. And I wanted to, to engage with something that, and also writing about politics all the time just made me sad. Like it made me, like, it made me cross and, and sad. And I wanted to write about something that was important culturally and politically and ethically yeah. uh, that I was deemed important. So, so people, it was a smaller audience, a smaller crowd. A lot of non-scholars would read this, will read the stuff and would, I set up, I had the first conference in 2015. We set up the journal in 2015. I published my first monograph on martial arts studies in 2015. And it was a much smaller crowd, um, uh, but uh, people that I really wanted to speak to and really liked speaking to. And I really liked the fact that you're immediately speaking outside of academia as well. It's people who are real experts, but not professional academics. Mm. And we all get together and we all just share our love martial arts in different ways. We share this passion in different ways. Colleagues, uh, some colleagues dismissed it. Most of them thought that it was a weird, uh, eccentric thing to do and thing to be into. They still do. You know, it's like a weird, nerdy, eccentric thing. And, you know, one senior colleague actually just said, why, like, you kind of wanted me, said, you shouldn't do this. Like, you just, why don't you, you should do what you were doing before? Because mm. a lot more people will read that and you'll have a lot more of a, a kind of impact. But the impact I wanted to have might, have, yeah, it might inherently be smaller and more kind of niche in Britain. But globally, I mean, the, the interest in martial arts in East Asia and, and in America and all over, all over Europe is huge. Um, so the impact was one of, that's a bit weird, but, but as it's grown and as, as we've been connected up with more and more projects in different ways and more kind of political and cultural projects, it's, it's more obviously not weird narcissistic and nerdy because there's mm. issues to do with health to do with uh, you know integration to do with psychology to do with to do with gender and, and trans and lgbtq and to do with globalization and to do and once you can articulate clearly why this is a, 
a valid and useful thing to be involved in. People kind of go, okay, yeah, I can, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because within academia, you'll often get that steer or that advice on what's the best way forward according to the kind of, you know, uh, the, the most popular journals or the way to get more citations or all these kinds of things. And they're not actually always going to be conducive to us making the contribution to the broader society that we really ultimately want to have. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I had, I had similar advice with a couple of colleagues were saying, you need to think really strategically about where you publish, where you publish. And it was in its own right, it was sound advice, but I saw your journal as well. And I was like, well, not only is there that, the, the martial arts studies journal has got this, uh, focus that i like but just even the fact that it's open access the fact that somebody can go onto a website and download an article and read it without having to pay for anything you think well this seems so obvious that academia should be this accessible to anybody yeah um, well i think i think that the the thing is that um because of the structure of of university systems in britain and in the us and, and in europe as well people are constantly chasing it's almost like they feel like that the ship is on fire they need to jump to the next ship you know and it's it's they're constantly running across a bridge that they feel is burning at the other end and 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 this happens a lot actually where people think that they're making the right strategic decisions but actually what they are is disciplinary decisions that are conservative decisions that are that are that are that are often reproducing structures that should be destroyed. So that why are we open access? We're open access because we should be, we can be. Universities can be, it's pennies to produce an open access journal. Also, I think that if you talk about decolonizing the curriculum, we need to absolutely decolonize our publishing regimes because, right, if I, if I need to think about the journals I should publish in, right, they'll often have a, you have to make them open access as well now. So an article for me to publish in a journal I should publish in might cost £2,000 for that to be open access, which it has to be for other career reasons, like you should put that into the research assessment framework, and it has to be open access. But what that, my university can pay £2,000 for me to publish some article in some pres prestigious journal. But it, a, a, a university in an African country or, or in one of the countries on the Indian co continent or somewhere in Asia, they can't do that. So what we're doing is we are um, reinforcing structures of elitism and hierarchy that we should be utterly removing. And all these publishers that say academics should pay to have their books published and that's, that's ludicrous because where, what are we funding? What are we underpinning? Why? Why should we pay anyone to have our We can just put it online for free. As long as it's peer reviewed, that's the, the unique thing about academic work is it should be peer reviewed, blind peer reviewed. It should go through all different forms of critique and testing and challenge. Uh, that's the difference between narcissistic publishing and academic publishing. It's or vanity publishing. It's like you have to be subject to the harrowing ordeals of people who are likely to hate and or disagree with your work. So as long as it's open, as long as it, that's happened, that's all you can expect from academia. Peer review should be free. Everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's lots to talk about that idea of vanity publishing being a dated concept. On the providing that it's peer reviewed, so providing you can get peer, you you, you get a rigorous peer review process. This idea of who it's published by and where it's published, yeah. we really need to sort of move beyond. Um, so what, in terms of martial arts studies, you've recently started a podcast. Yes. Do you, do you want to talk a bit about pop? Cause I'm just starting this out as well. So I think this is going to be a, a thing as well with, with what's going on with lockdown. I think we're, we're desperate for conversations and connection. Um, yeah. this, just doing this now, I don't necessarily have the time, but I, it's good for the soul. Like yeah. how have you found podcasting in relation to the to martial arts studies? Yeah, I think it's, it's, so what happened was I had to finish, because of lockdown, I had to finish my teaching online and I was trying to do lectures, like, so I'm talking to a PowerPoint or talking to a Prezi or talking to, and it, I hated it because my voice was boring me and I hated it because I like to be in a room, look at students, you know, if you make a witty quip or you think something's funny and you've got that whole interaction and I thought this isn't, 
working for me. So I decided that um, why didn't I just have a conversation with like a, another expert on the subject, given that we had to record it online anyway, and, and certain things like Zoom allow us to record conversations. So, because the students weren't giving feedback, because they're sitting at home going, because mm, they're not in a, the same room as you. You can't look at them in the eye and put that pressure on them, interpolate them as students and go, you have to answer my question or you have to get into this. So I had conversations like on, on Rancière with Rancière experts, on political theory with political theory experts, and on, 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 on the body with different experts. And, and I found that I was really enjoying it because the start of lockdown was a bit weird and we were all calling our families every day, which we don't normally do. And that's kind of <laughs> what we don't normally do. But we weren't yeah. getting any other kind of stimulation. Mm. And I personally was finding the whole thing so disorientating. Mm. I couldn't write. I mean, I write a lot. I would, I would write every, every working day. I would make sure I spent an hour writing for me, like writing my research, my notes, my thoughts. But there's kids in the house. My wife's in the house. I'm in the house. Mm. And I just couldn't do it. And I found that I'd enjoyed the, the conversation so much that I would continue it as a, as a podcast with, because I've got, have, having organized the conference in the journal for five years, I have got lots of contacts. And I thought, these are really interesting people. I'd like to talk to the so-and-so about this subject. And I wanted to talk to you about things around jujitsu and health and mental health and, 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 yeah. and so on. And, and it was an interesting idea. I've enjoyed it. It's filled a gap in my life, which was the gap that would be writing because I still can't write because the temporality of the day is screwed up. But I actually yeah. think that um, it's, it's filling another gap for, so my, the idea of martial arts studies for me was always that it should be a network and a field, like not a kingdom. So people come together, we share ideas, we peer review, we kick our ideas back and forth. Um, and it just needed a, 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 like a nexus. So that's, I'm not like the king of the field. I'm not, I'm, it's not my thing. No one pays me any money. I'm not in charge or anything. I just go, hey, let's have a conference. And people go, yeah, okay. Hey, let's have a journal. Come and put, and people go, all right then. Because academics tend to work on their own stuff and it takes someone else to say, come on, let's have a chat about that. So I do that. And, and, and I'm enjoying doing it. And I think that hopefully it's bringing it to an audience of people who wouldn't necessarily read the journals, wouldn't read the books, yeah. Wouldn't get, couldn't get to the conferences if they wanted to because they're elsewhere in the world and I hope that it's sort of adding an extra dimension making it real sharing the ideas because the martial arts as a field is full of myths and bullshit and, and and weird ideas and it's good to talk to real scholars like real historians who really know about the history of China can read Chinese can read the classical Chinese know about it rather than go on oh yeah Tai Chi was invented on a mountain like 2000 years ago and it's like <laughs> more complicated than that so, yeah. Yeah. brilliant um what do you think then there's, there's lots and there's there's so many things that, uh, we could talk about i was going to ask you a bit about the ufc so the, in terms of maybe a touch of serendipity and and timing but doing martial arts studies at a time when the ufc has gone bomb yeah um and is attracting interest from audiences that would never have watched martial arts in the past. Yeah. What, what do you, do you think that's really helped the field pick up, picks up, pick up some momentum? Uh, I think that the, the, the media, the global media success of, of the UFC has brought the concept of martial arts and combat sports much more into the mainstream because it's in the concept of sport now in the West. So martial arts were always quite niche, quite, um, quite um, you know, unique. There's places that you sent children to learn gross motor skills um, and, 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 you know, a bit of resilience. And, but if you're an adult doing martial arts, you were always a, a, bit, a bit weird. But then by the time you get to, you start to get Taekwondo in the Olympics in 2000 and you start getting British gold medals 2012 2016 and then boxing and you get women's boxing and then you get the UFC and you get Ronda Rousey and then you get Conor McGregor who British people get confused and think that because he's from Ireland therefore he's British right because they <laughs> especially English people don't know what Britain is right and where its borders are yeah so we love him we love him <laughs> so where, yeah, he speaks, he speaks English. Exactly. You're laughing. <laughs> so, um, so I think you get it moves into the mainstream between 2012 and 2015, and I think that it's recast martial arts as something that's normal and acceptable because it a lot of it becomes sport. So you're not just a weirdo, either a hippie who's doing tai chi or or kung fu, 
or a weirdo who's doing some kind of ninjutsu or Krav Maga and therefore you're like, you're, you must be a bit screwy right in the head. It's, it's acceptable. It's a norm. It's, it's sports centers. It's normal stuff now. Um, and I think the UFC blazed that trail, big style, to make it more intelligible. And, you know, and, and the UFC became less brutalized, less brutal, less obviously brutal. I think that really helped it. Um, yeah, the UFC has been, since 1993, it's had a huge impact on martial arts practice around the world and on the status of martial arts around the world. Not all good, but it's certainly raised, it brings things into the public consciousness and the practitioner consciousness that would otherwise not have been there. Yeah, I didn't realise until the other day that it was, as an organisation, it was like that just before Dana White bought it and Dana White could have came in just at the right time and until then, when it, sh it kind of really took off, it was really struggling as an organisation. Yeah. Um, you've just published a piece, haven't you, about masculinity and uh, representation in the UFC or media representations around the UFC. Do yeah. you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I think that's really interesting. Uh, well, the, uh, there's a. Uh, it, it was a, the idea was a guy. Um, a professor in Durham at Durham University called uh, Kai Schiller, who, who, who was interested in masculinity and combat sports. He's, I think he's interested in sport and masculinity and, and the way that that's changed and functions in different ideological contexts over the years. And I've never wanted to talk, I don't like to talk in an established theme, like, so I don't want to talk about cultural appropriation or toxic masculinity because these are just like kind of really nebulous populist kind of themes. But I thought it was a good opportunity to hit some of those themes and to try and do something different with them. So I, I, I wrote a provocative title and it was Intoxicating Masculinity and it was about toxic masculinity and it's about MMA hard men um, and media representation. I thought I'd just try and draw people into this by hitting a lot of key terms, toxic masculinity, uh, media representation and so on. Uh, and my argument was, well, I, really it was inspired by a Grayson Perry a television series called um, All Man and the first episode was called Hard Men and Grayson Perry goes to County Durham and Newcastle and he, and he sees these MMA fighters and he kind of scrapes at their, at their exoskeleton of toughness and they watch them fall to pieces and cry and talk about how they've been traumatized and brutalized and so on by either personal you know misfortune or the socio-political destruction of the northeast economy. Um, and I wanted to, and he, it, it just raised loads and loads of interesting questions and people should watch the Grace and Perry series if they can. It's just fabulous about the construction of masculinity. And my, I guess a strong part of my argument was that there's nothing inherently macho about MMA. It's just the stories we tell about it. Yeah. And that, that if you can, if you can see how easily Grace and Perry can go in and tell a different story about it and actually get practitioners to say, yeah, like some people are saying, I love it because it's a performance and I love the performance of it. And I love putting the face makeup on and I love doing this. And other people go and I do this because I, it's the only place I feel happy. It's my happy place. Mm -hmm. and, and so we only tell, we tell hero narratives. We tell, I know you're interested in, you're interested in narratives and, and cultural narratives and how we live through them and how important they are. And they are important. And I totally agree with that. And we should consciously think about not worrying about whether MMA is too violent or something like that, but what kind of media rep does it get? What kind of stories do we tell about it? There are so many different stories to tell about masculinity and femininity and gender and so. And I think that those stories are streamlined by the media. So my argument was, yeah, MMA is a thing, but our access to it is nine times out of 10 through stories about it. Yeah. Um, and why don't we tell some different stories about MMA and masculinity? Yeah. Because the stories are all there to be told, especially people who read about fighters or interview the fighters or whatever. The stories are there. It's just what we choose to pull out as part of our kind of cultural mythology around the UFC. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, I was going to keep this to about half an hour, which I think yeah. we've run out of time. So, five minutes we've been talking, surely. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's always five minutes. Uh, but thanks very much for talking to me again. And uh, I hope people enjoy listening to us. And uh, I'm sure I'll speak to you soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. Cheers. Bye-bye.